Cat TV is celebrating 30 years of community media. Help support Cat TV's next 30 years by becoming a member today. Your membership will help us continue covering meaningful, local content. Thank you for supporting your local community media station. Hey, welcome, everyone. I, uh, I'm Brian Campion. I uh, have the pleasure of living two lives, really. One as this, one of the state senators in this district, as well as being the director of public policy programs here at the Center for the Advancement of Public Action. I am going to introduce our president, Laura Walker, who is going to welcome all of you, as well as Senator Leahy. And then I'm going to take the mic back and say a few words, and then we will get started. So with that, President Walker. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, good evening and welcome, Senator Leahy, to Bennington College and all of you. Um, about two years ago, it was I think this month actually, about two years ago, I had been um, president of Bennington for just a couple of months and my phone rings and it's Senator Leahy. Um, and I was like, Wow, um, he was such a hero of mine. And I remember actually back in 1974, I was in high school and I was just very involved in the Vietnam War. And I remember that he was the newest and most junior member of the Senate Armed Service Committee. And they were asked to uh, vote to reauthorize and continue the war in Vietnam. And um, he, he cast the vote that led to the defeat, uh, to, to that being defeated. Um, and he said afterwards, I was proud to be that vote. My hope was Vermonters would respect my judge judgment and my conscience, even though many, many Vermonters were not in support. Um, and even if they disagreed with my vote to end the war, I learned early in my career that good judgment and hard work are exactly what Vermonters expect from their representatives. And I think that really, really is true about Vermont. So I got on the phone with him and I babbled. I said, hello, to Senator Leahy. And I told him how much I loved Vermont and Bennington College. And he's like, he just kind of put me at ease and became a human being and talked to me about Marcel and his family. And I just was so privileged. Uh, I had a smile on my face um, because he had welcomed me to Vermont. And I had not just met one of my heroes, I had met a really, really great man. Um, so eight times Vermonters have sent Senator Leahy to Washington, nearly 47 years. Um, and a year ago in November, he made a speech and said, it's time to go home. So we in Bennington, we welcome you home, Senator Leahy. We are so pleased to welcome you to uh, Bennington and back to Vermont, uh, where you will then now put down even stronger roots. And we are also delighted to, to welcome you to these um, forums that we're, we're uh, putting on today. These conversations, these public policy forum and forums have examined over the last several weeks the immense struggles in our democracy. They've brought together some of the most interesting voices in this struggle, both here in Vermont and nationally. Tonight, we have the absolute honor to talk with Senator Leahy. What a privilege it is to talk with someone who for close, for close to 40 years fought for Vermonters and guided uh, this wonderful country toward its future. And as you'll hear from Brian, we are delighted also to name these public policy forums after Senator Leahy. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, President Walker. <clears throat> Thank you, President Walker. <clears throat> Before we get started, I do wanna recognize uh, John Tracy, who is in the audience tonight. Many of us, John, if you would raise your hand, many of us in Montpelier know John as an incredible legis former legislator, somebody who fought many hard fights for all of us, similar fights to those that we're going to be talking about this evening. And, but I think most of all, we know him as Senator Leahy's right-hand man. We truly do. And I just wanna recognize John and thank him for his incredible service to Vermont to Senator Leahy, and of course, to all of us. So thank you, John. Mm -hmm. 
So to get started, in the center of this building are carved these words by Adlai Stevenson. As citizens of the demo this democracy, you are the rulers and the ruled, the lawgivers and the law abiding, the beginning and the end. These words are at the heart of this building and the people in it. Whether student, teacher, or visitor, we all recognize the importance and the potential of the citizen and how the strength of the citizen reflects the strength of this democracy. To accomplish this work, this building always looks outward. It indeed has a responsibility to those here at the college, but it recognizes that the citizen, that citizenship is not static, but rather a lifelong pursuit. Tonight, we are honoring somebody who epitomizes that pursuit. Someone whom for the past 48 years has worked to address the needs of our nation head on. How does one honor an individual who leads such a life? We've been asking ourselves at Bennington College that question for the past several months. And the answer, we make sure their work never ends. We educate, empower, and encourage students so they have the tools, the knowledge, and the partners to continue this shared mission. To that end, six years ago, Susan Scorbati, our director here, and I started our public policy forums as a way to bring work that was being done in Montpelier in DC to students and the greater Bennington community to create an opportunity for these groups to learn from one another, to talk about ideas, discuss issues with policymakers, scientists, scholars, and propose possible solutions to some of our most pressing problems. We have since dedicated conversations to addressing climate change, foreign policy, plastic pollution, voting rights, public education, and this year's series examines the state of our democracy. Through these forums, we will continue the work, Senator, that you have done your entire life and continue your dedication to equal rights, a healthy environment, and a strong democracy. Students here tonight, as well as future generations of students will follow the trail that you have blazed, Senator Leahy. And so from here on out, our public policy forums will be known as the Patrick J. Leahy public policy forums. Thank you, Senator, for all you have done for us. We hope to honor your legacy through this, through these sessions now and in the future. And now we'd like to continue the work. Thank you. Well, that, that's it. Uh, can you hear me there? Perfectly. Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, <laughs> I remember when we first started using some of these Zoom things, one of my young grandchildren said, here, let me show you how to do it because it's very complicated, Grandpa. And I, I said, thank you very much. I only been in the, uh, the Senate for about 35 years at that point, and I needed the instruction as child. But President Walker, I remember so well that phone call with you, and I uh, thank you for taking my call. And I enjoyed talking. I enjoyed talking with you. We went off the subject a few times, but it was just getting to know you. And I was thinking, as a as a Vermonter, I thought. Boy, this is great that she's going to be leading one of our hallmark institutions in Vermont. And Brian, uh, you know, you and I have been friends. You mentioned John Tracy, now runs by a Vermont office. He's always said nice things about you in the in the legislature. Both Marcel and I have enjoyed your hospitality down there 
it's probably just as well sometimes it wasn't a microphone around as we made candid opinions of what works and what doesn't but i was always impressed with what you had to say and i appreciate being there and it um and having this named after me in in a college or institution that i admire and, and appreciate think of all the people i've met over the years that went there uh people who came to my office uh and one who became my chief of staff and one time before the white house took her away and i i get inspired every time i come there one day i i like to drive down uh from our home especially this time of year with the foliage from our home in, in Middlesex. I sometimes find our if you have an evening thing, I just as soon spend the night in Bennington than to turn around and drive back. But Brian, how would you like to uh, conduct this? Well, uh, I thought Bennington College students have been involved with pulling together some questions. So I thought I would go ahead and pose these to you and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. The first one uh, has to do with what I think may have been your first experience with the town of Bennington. And that was likely when you met Governor Wills. <laughs> you had a very early encounter with the governor and I'm wondering if you might tell us about that encounter. Well, I talk about, I have a book that I spent some time writing and that's toward the beginning. I, you know, I was born in Montpelier. Our home was diagonally across the street from the state house. And as a little boy, I don't know if I remember when I was four years old or six years old, but one of my friends and I would take our tricycles and ride all over the place. And we decided one day, it looked like there's nobody in the uh, state house. The legislature was in session. We just walked to the door, took our tricycles, um, carried them up or lifted them up the stairs and started what I now know as a Senate chamber. So let's race. So we go barreling down, uh, down the halls. There's a door open at the end. And I didn't know that was the governor's office. And we came roaring through and crash up against a desk that appeared to be about 25 feet high. And this man leans over and he goes, yes. And I said, oh, are you the governor? Yes, I am. Now get out. And uh, okay. And, but he was laughing and he had a jar of candy on the uh, on his desk. He gave us some candy and said, now go. And so we went home and told my mother and father about this. We thought it was so much fun. They did not share the enthusiasm that we had for it. And we were told we could go to the state house with our parents anytime we want, but no more tricycle riding in the, uh, in the state house. In fact, now when I come in there into that office, Phil Scott says, don't run into the desk. <laughs> I don't know if it's the same desk, but it doesn't look like it's 30 feet high. Well, one of our students that has already devoured your book was really interested in what it was like, because you mentioned campaigning for JFK. What was it like growing up as a Catholic in a state that was dominated by Protestant leadership and then running for office in that, in that same state? Well, it was interesting. I, uh, you know, I'd go around wearing my St. Michael's jacket and St. Michael's was uh, different than it is now. It was all male and 99% Catholic and everybody knew that. And people would come to the door and listen to my earnest uh, pleas for John F. Kennedy. I wasn't old enough to vote for him. Uh, but they said, well, we don't like Richard Nixon, but you really 
can't expect us to vote for a Catholic. Uh, and I think today we're so much different. In fact, first time I ran, uh, now this was a few years later, I, when I announced it, the age of 33, I, we took a poll about being a Catholic. 5% of the people in Vermont at that time said they couldn't vote for me because I was a Catholic. Another 5% said the only reason they would vote for me because I was Catholic. And then after that, I don't think anybody cares uh, who who is uh, elected. And as far as their religion is more what their philosophy and what they stand for. Uh, I remember the thrill of uh, then Senator Kennedy coming making his last stop I believe in Burlington and big crowd at the airport and then went off to his own home and watching the results and being very depressed and suddenly realizing, well, we have three electoral votes now. States with much higher number of electoral votes were coming through for him. So I, um, I think that uh, today we don't have to overcome religious prejudice. There are other prejudices we have to overcome. I cannot understand the prejudice against immigrants, for example. Uh, we're all descended from immigrants. My maternal uh, grandparents came to Vermont. Grandfathers of stone carving, they came from Italy and raised a family, all of whom did well. Uh, the Irish side of our family came a couple of generations earlier in the mid 1800s, uh, also stone carvers. And they, they worked hard to raise families. Uh, I was lucky I became the first Leahy to get a college degree, my sister the second one. But it, with all of them, my grandparents, uh, parents, you had that respect for the institutions, for the law, for the constitution. And we have got to go back to giving that to all our, uh, our families and have to explain that we are all equal, uh, no matter the color of our skin or nationality or the language we uh, first spoke, uh, we are all equal. Thank you for that. So uh, one student was reflecting on how much things have changed while you were, you've been in the Senate and particularly how things have gotten done. And we're wondering if you might say a few words about when you've arrived, when you arrived versus today, have the wheelings and dealings changed? And if so, how? Well, when, when I came there, there was uh, an understanding, in fact, it was pretty much a rule. You always kept your word. Whether you had a, you're going to vote differently, well, then tell the person you're going to. I certainly had cases where I had to tell the leadership I wasn't going to vote with them. The chair of the uh, Armed Services Committee had strongly supported the war in Vietnam. He told me nobody from Vermont, they may have criticized the war, but none ever voted to end the war. And I, uh, he was the leader. He wanted me to vote to continue the war. I explained to him that I told the people when I ran in Vermont that I would vote against the war. And at that time, the majority of Vermont, it's hard to believe now, supported the war. And I was going to vote no. Uh, I assumed after they had five votes and he lost, that um, he'd be angry at me. He took me aside after he said, well, I totally disagree with your vote, but you kept your word. And that's the most important thing here. Mike Mansfield others said, keep your word and across the political spectrum. And that's the way things get done. Now it's almost like 
Well, I'll change my position if I read a, a poll two minutes later and I got a chance to go on this or that uh, news item uh, or news hour or uh, on whatever it might be. And that is that destroys the Senate. The Senate should be the conscience of the nation. It's always been an imperfect conscience, but it's much worse today. So you have been a part of, you know, along these same lines, many confirmation hearings for justices, including the Supreme Court. We are curious what your experience has been in those hearings. How have they changed over the years? And how would you reform the confirmation process for Supreme Court justices? Well, for one thing, it'd be nice if people follow the rule. You know, the uh, last three justices were rammed to. We're not allowed to have back, uh, full background checks on it. That was stopped by the uh, Trump administration. And it, uh, and then you had the chair of the committee uh, not allowing the time that's supposed to be taken, getting pressure on the White House, and they ran things through. This was never allowed before. Uh, people talk about the confirmation hearings for Judge Bork. They use the expression, well, he was Bork as well. No, he lost in the he lost in the committee. Democrats controlled it, but they said it's the Supreme Court justice. Even though he lost, he should be allowed to have a vote on the Senate floor. And some Democrats voted for him. Enough Republicans voted against him. They didn't uh, didn't get confirmed. People tend to forget that. We tried to make sure that they all had their, their vote. Now look when uh, uh, Antonin Scalia died and Merrick Garland was somebody that almost every Republican Democrat on the uh, Judiciary Committee had praised, but Mitch McConnell was then the majority leader, said, no, we can't have a uh, confirmation in uh, in an election year. Uh, we'll wait to see how the most of that, the next president do it. There's never been a time we did this and so on. Well, yes, there was. Uh, the first confirmation I voted on, the Democrats were in charge. Uh, it was an election year. Uh, Ronald Reagan was leaving. Uh, and Anthony Kennedy uh, was brought up in election year, and he passed about 90 votes. Actually, the first one I voted was John Paul Stevens, and that was over and done within a week. And he turned out to be a very, very good consensus justice. Now it's become uh, politicized. If it's not your party, uh, you shouldn't vote for them. Well, I remember Barry Goldwater coming to me and saying, I'm recommending Senator Day O'Connor. She's more conservative than you are, Patrick, but she's an honest person. She keeps her word. She is a top-notch lawyer. And uh, I'd hope to have your support. He gave me some of the background on her. I met her. I called uh, Senator Goldwater up and I said, She's uh, nominated. I'll support her. I, I always use the view. I've, I've tried a lot of cases in Vermont, in the Vermont Supreme Court, and I uh, argued cases before federal courts, both in Vermont, the second court, the second circuit. I didn't ask myself, who was who the president that nominated these people? These judges, are they honest? Are they fair? And I've always been always been happy with that. Certainly the nominees that I've, I've recommended to various presidents, I've gone to them and one uh, was a Republican, two were Republicans, uh, and uh, to significant positions. The president asked me about that, I said, I think there's general consensus in our state that these are two of the most honest 
fair people you're going to uh, find. That's not happening now. You have the Federalist Society that basically grooms uh, judges and then hope they'll have a president who will be uh, flattered, that's what it was, flattered into nominating him. And this is what happened with Trump. And it was enabled with the first one of them because uh, the then majority leader had blocked Merrick Garland, a man that normally would have gone through with 90 votes. And, uh, but here's what's happened. By doing that, it has hurt the U.S. Senate. It has hurt the Supreme Court. If people lose respect for what we might pass as laws, but even more so, if they lose respect to our U.S. Supreme Court, and Justice um, Alito has certainly tried to bring that about, then we, we are hurting in this country. I, I don't mean going to a lecture, but um, you have to, you have to keep your word. You have to be honest, express your opinion. When I, um, it may take a long time. Um, I get, uh, I think when I wrote the organic farm bill, I wish I had first heard about the need for it and it's sitting at a farmer's table in Vermont. It was blocked for years by Jeff C. Helms. It's just a uh, crunchy granola thing. Well, I worked hard with a key Republican on the Senate Agriculture Committee. We came together and we passed it. That crunchy granola idea is now a 55 to $60 billion nationwide industry. And, and I'm, I'm proud of it. Although if I could tell you just one quick story on that, we had it uh, tucked in the farm bill, we're down for the signing ceremony. And, uh, you know, it's a big pile of paper and place for the president to sign. I was, as the author of it, I was standing behind the first President Bush he leans back to me, he says, Pat, did you read every word of this bill? I said, Mr. President, you're the one signing it. I read about as much of it as you did. <laughs> and the press was trying to hear what we were laughing about. Bush just walks out past the press and they're going, what are you? And so I'm coming, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, what was the joke? I said, I was so excited to be there. I forgot it. Which was around the corner. He gave me a big hug when I came out. He said, "Thanks for, thanks for covering for me." <laughs> well, along those lines, we were struck by the image of you, Bob Dole, Richard Lugar, uh, and President Bush at that 1990 signing, and you know, we feel like it, it, students and, and others feel as though it's those are sort of days gone by republicans and democrats coming together to ad advance an issue what happened what 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 has transpired over the years that those days with you know and we've all seen tip o'neill joking with with george bush when he was vice president at the podium you joking with george herbert walker bush in, in that moment but something has has, has disappeared I think everybody is so eager to make a, a two second or five second sound bite that they can praise themselves. Uh, and, you know, you got to get do this to get reelected. There's been 1900 senators in the history of the country. I've served with over 400 of them. There are a lot of the fall there. I got to get a sound bites so I get reelected. I called them my former colleagues because most of them did. And, and whereas those who did the work made it through. And uh, and you don't always win. Uh, try to do it. And if you think you're right, take that position and try to get others to join you on it. Uh, we're going to have a major, major battle in the Senate, we come back after the elections, 
to get through what we call the omnibus. Uh, you've heard uh, Congressman McCarthy say that if they get the majority and he's speaker, we've got to start thinking of cutting aid to Ukraine. Uh, he's forgetting that Putin is a war criminal and we should be standing up to him. Uh, don't take the position that Donald Trump did that began the war that Putin's a genius. He's not, he's a criminal. But the point being, we've got to get this bill through this year. Many people, Republicans and Democrats, are hoping that the first year that we can get it through. Uh, and, and I believe we will. And we've talked about it even the last couple of days. Uh, he called me in Vermont and he's about to go out of the country, but we were agreeing on major points and we'll get it done. But if you want to politicize everything and forget what the country needs, then we all hurt, we all lose. Uh, a less serious question, uh, and this was asked by many students and faculty and staff. What was it like to share the screen with Heath Ledger? <laughs> you know, I got teased the other day. Somebody said, oh, great. Um, you know, you have 48 years in the Senate. What are you going to be remembered for as the guy who's in five Batman movies? And just for a little bit of background, after I had a couple of surgeries when I smashed my hip, spent a month in the hospital, I had to learn to walk again, came in the first time I was back on the floor of the center, it was going to be an all night long session. And I was going to, to be in a wheelchair. You look at the wheelchair is black. Marcel said, we can order some bat signals on the side of it. I thought, okay, we'll see what happens. Somebody said, can you bring a a um, wheelchair with bat signals on it? I said, well, not if the, uh, you can't do that if the president pro tem objects. I went, no, he said, it's okay. And <laughs> <laughs> so I came rolling onto there and it was one time of levity in the 30 hour session where both uh, Republicans and Democrats applauded it. Well, I'd like to go back to those days. Now, the Heath Ledger thing, that was in one of the Dark Knight ones, and he comes in to terrorize this party in the, the Wayne penthouse, fires a shotgun, and everybody's cowering. And I stepped forward and said, we're not intimidated by thugs. Well, you know, what, what to be remembered for. And he comes over to me, he says, hmm. And he grabs my face. He's got a, this, what looks like a very sharp knife. It was plastic, but it looked on film very sharp. He said, you remind me of my father. I hated my father. He was about to kill me when somebody said, uh, stop. And he looks at the woman and says, oh, throws me a cycle, goes, oh, my darling, and starts walking toward her. We had to film that about six times from different angles. Each time I had to look right and each time I got thrown back on uh, crashing into uh, the wall and so on. It, it was fun, but here's what happened. Um, Michael Caine, who made the, got his, um, Oscar here in, in Vermont when he filmed Cider House Rules and he and I know each other and he takes uh, Ledger aside and says, I say there, he, one would think one couldn't come to the United States and toss a United States Senator around like that. Well, <laughs> he, 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 we've been outside, he says his name is Patrick and I said, my name is Heath. So he's Patrick Leahy, he is a very senior member of the Senate. Heath goes to the director and says, look, I, I'm here on a uh, visa. Am I going to get in trouble for you? <laughs> <laughs> the director said, heck no, you're, you're talking to the biggest Batman fan in the, in the country. I, 
you know, I had my first library card when I was four and I started reading Batman. And uh, so now the serious part of all this, they pay a lot of money. I give every cent to the children's library in uh, Montpelier, which used to be in the basement. I had my first library card there that I sit at four. Uh, wonderful librarian, encouraged people to read. I mean, you want to read Batman? Fine. Try this is by a man named Charles Dickens. Oh, you got another Batman. Well, try, uh, try this. It's by, you see where I'm going, uh, Mark Twain. Or, and I'd read all those by the time I was in third grade and it gave me a love of reading. And I, I love it when our children read and, and our grandchildren come and visit. They've always got books with them. So urge people and uh, Madam President, I know your college does this. You don't have censorship. You tell people read, read, read. Don't listen to these people who say we're going to ban this book or that book because this one doesn't have a liberal idea or this one has a conservative idea. Read, read enough so you can make up your own mind. And that's where you're going to succeed. Yeah. Don't ban books. <laughs> so if you would, uh, tell us a little bit about legislation and votes that you are most proud of in your career. Well, obviously the ending the Vietnam War, I'm proud of that. After I, I've cast over 17,000 votes, wow. uh, most of anybody currently in the Senate. And certainly the vote, because I thought it would cost me my first reelection when I voted to end the Vietnam War and the attention given that it was the deciding vote. Um, then I wrote what's called the Leahy Law. We don't send foreign aid to uh, military units and others that violate uh, human rights. And it depends on what the administration is, how well it's enforced or not. But I just uh, <clears throat> blocked $75 million to a country, an ally of ours, because they were not following the Leahy Law. And the Green Farm Bill that had everything. Uh, from organic farming to dramatic improvements in how we do our agriculture. Landmines, uh, we became the first country in the world to ban the export of landmines. It's a law I wrote and I was a very, uh, well, I was very happy when other countries uh, passed a similar law and let me know that they named it the Leahy Law. Um, I, I, had a, uh, I, I was the one in charge of updating the Violence Against Women Act. I added the uh, LGBTQ community, which had not been in there before, Native Americans who had not been in there, because it, uh, the complexity of the abuser was a non-Native American and a Native American uh, was under the jurisdiction of the, uh, of where they were living. And then, um, then we had it as it was going through, we debated for two or three days and I said, I have another technical amendment involving child exploitation about this thing and passed it because of the credibility I had. And I was joined by a conservative Republican, Mike Crapo. We passed this to knowing that the large percentage of runaway children are sought out by uh, sexual exploiter uh, and this added 
tremendously to the penalties of those who would go after them. And I had seen what happens to that when I was a state's attorney and, and, and I wanted to do that. We, I look at home, of course, I, Marcel and I both love to hike. We've greatly expanded the Green Mountain National Forest. My idea being that you can always, if you expand it too much, you can always sell it back. But if you develop it, you're never going to be able to get it. So it gives you time to, to do it. And the things you can do to protect Vermont, uh, the uh, uh, Lily Ledbetter legislation so that women are treated the same as men by pay and promotion and everything else. And Lily Ledbetter has been to Vermont a couple of times to speak at the program I have every year on uh, uh, for for women, uh, women uh, economic opportunity, uh, and she has come up to speak on that. And then one one I'm particularly proud of uh, is called the War Victims Fund, and eventually named after me by a Republican leader. Can I just tell you a short story of that? I'd been in war zones and both Marcel and I, we'd seen the people lost legs and arms from landmines. Um, and knew what had happened in Vietnam. We didn't have full um, relationships with Vietnam yet, but I, I worked with a Vietnam veteran, Bobby Muller, who'd been paralyzed with weights down from his uh, injuries in Vietnam and worked with uh, first President Bush who supported it and set up a thing with um, where we could get wheelchairs or prosthetics to people who lost their limbs, primarily from um, uh, American landmines. And I brought a number of senators with me on a very hot day you had these men who've been crawling for um, years, no legs, one sitting very neatly on a, on a stool, a very small man watching me all the way through the speeches where they're saying, blah, 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 Patrick Lay and so on. And I thought, God, he must hate me. Here's somebody six foot two and uh, probably looked like the soldiers that he had fought against. They asked me to pick him up and put him in his wheelchair. All the time he's staring at me. I'm thinking how he must hate me. I picked him up myself. The nurse explained how to pick him up without hurting him. I pick him up. I put him in the wheelchair. I started to get up. He grabbed my shirt. He pulled me down and kissed me. That was a pretty emotional thing. I will never forget that. The same thing happened to John Glenn, who was there with me. John, the best people I've ever known, was not very emotional. He had tears coming down his face. And when I came back and told the president, so did he. So um, those are among the things I, 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 I just, you know, I could, there are thousands of pieces of legislation, but those really stand out. Incredible. Thank you for sharing that and, and, and for the work behind it, um, all of them. Back to your time uh, in the Senate. Tell us, I mean, you've served with many, many, many presidents. Can you just share a few highlights of your work with those that have been in the Oval Office, anecdotes, uh, particular experiences. We know you were uh, then Senator Obama's uh, mentor and Mrs. Leahy served as uh, Mrs. Obama's mentor when they arrived. So, and we know you had a great relationship with the Obamas. Anything there in particular or, or with any of the presidents that you served with that you wanna share? Well, I, I worked with uh... President Obama, we were we were friends. I mean, when we were in the Senate, we were just outrageous. I mentioned this in in the book. 
uh, we would trash talk each other in the Senate. You would think that we were, he has a great sense of humor. And we would just tease the heck out of each other. He especially talked about my ancient sneakers. And, um, but we would walk out of there with our arms around each other, laughing our heads off. And I kept working with him on Cuba. I, I wanted us to go back to, to Cuba to open up. Uh, he was concerned because we had Alan Gross, the Cubans had been holding as a prisoner under charges totally un undeserved. I had met him many times in prison, made trips down, talked with uh, both President Castro Fidel and Raul about uh, people they were holding in prison of their own and ours. And we finally worked out uh, a day I'll never forget. At uh, about five o'clock or so in the morning, out of Andrews Air Force Base, getting on the president's backup plane with a big uh, United States of America blue with uh, the con congressman now senator from Alan Gross's district and Alan's uh, wife, we we took off for Cuba. Two other planes took off at the same time. One had the, the three remaining members of the so-called Cuban Five that we had in life imprisonment. They were in the plane as the plane took off. The president back at the White House signed the commutation of their uh, sentences. And then a third, totally unmarked plane took off all to three different air bases. The unmarked one was picking up a CIA uh, agent had been held prisoner facing a death penalty uh, in Cuba. We all landed at the same time. I remember uh, one of the president's photographers, also my son-in-law, was clocking the time on his camera, taking pictures as we went out. We were on the ground 35 minutes. Alan Gross did not know he was being released. He looked out the, uh, he was, they came to his prison cells and pick up everything you have. He goes out, expected me in a prison van and said he was in a nice car. Went to an air airfield he'd never seen. Uh, all kinds of food there, looks out the window and sees that huge blue and white United States of America. Door opens, the first one down is our son-in-law, this camera. Then he sees his wife and me come down. And I walked in to him and I said, Alan, you want to go home? He just hugged me. <laughs> I'll admit, there maybe it was something in the air, but there's a little, little tears coming down both of us. He said, Patrick, I do. I said, let's go. 32 minutes later, we were airborne. And we we're sitting in the big conference room in the airplane. TV, the huge TV sets on, have the news, and somebody's on there saying, uh, we have an unconfirmed rumor that Alan Gross has been released. He had his feet up on the uh, conference table. He hurt his ankle. And he said, I I'll confirm it. I said, I said, Alan, look out the, uh, look out the window. That's the coast of Florida. You're in the United States, you're home. Just then the steward came in and said, Mr. Gross, uh, could you step into the president's office? Uh, he's on the phone, we'd like to talk with you. I said, Alan, that's a, a good talk to have. And I took, uh, I thought I could find it quickly. I took a picture of he and his wife in the office of the, uh, president's office after he had talked to the president, the president had welcomed him home. And, uh, and even though it's in my own book, it'd be nice if I could find it. Um, it yeah, I don't know what this will show, but over, uh, 
there's a picture of two two people uh, on the second row there staying with their hands on a uh, uh, chair. And there's a desk behind them. It's all paneled in there. It's not like the airplane I fly back and forth on, or you do either. But they just had their, they just talked with the president. Uh, their hands were top of each other. And I think it was finally coming in their home. But it also allowed, we had a president who had gone to uh, Cuba years ago, Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> He's not had a president since. And Obama went down as the first president. We started to go there. We started reopening things to Cuba. And one of the biggest, biggest mistakes, uh, I think the last president in just arbitrarily cutting off most of our progress with Cuba. And all that's done is hurt our standing in the world, but it's hurt the Cuban people, the young people who are making changes in Cuba and just threw that away as though they were some danger to us. I think of uh, Jimmy Carter, who uh, worked with, well, I was following the lead of a dear friend, the folk singer, Harry Chapin, who died much too young. I brought, uh, Harry wanted a hunger commission and we put one together. Harry was on it. John Denver was on it. Bob Dole was on it and I was on it. And we went down to see, uh, uh, President Carter who called me the night before. He said, yeah, make your point, but I'm going to agree to it. And I'll never forget Harry getting really excited about the reasons for it and Carter going, uh, Yes, Harry, but no, no, I got to tell you more. I said, Harry, don't talk him out of it. And this was a man, Harry Chapin was a man who raised so much money for people uh, uh, in hunger in, in our country from his concerts and, and everything else. But there were, there were so many stories of presidents who actually paid attention in both both parties. I think a lot is not seen as some of the behind the door uh, means of presence with both parties. Some work well, some don't. Um, the Ronald Reagan um, and Tip O'Neill would by tooth and nail during the day to get together for a drink in the evening and say, okay, what are some of the things we can agree on? And it's better for the country. There's not enough of that now. Certainly there wasn't with the last president. And I, and I don't mean this to be a anti-Trump brand. I think that he lost the opportunity to do things very positive for the country and has done things that are going to make it very difficult for the Supreme Court to regain their uh, credibility. So you, you showed us a few photos from the book and many people in this room, people like Judy Murphy, who you know quite well. Uh, I, yeah, uh, John told me Judy was, was there. Uh, and certainly Representative Corcoran, we know you're, you knew his yep. again. Jim used to tell me every time he would come into town, you know, that was your first stop. Jim Carroll was on the select board. We know you know his, knew his parents. And you probably took pictures of all of them. And you've taken pictures, I know, of me and sent them. And I'm curious, how did you get into to photography? And well, that, that love come I, out? I, I just love it. In fact, I a lot of important things, I had pictures of everybody else, but not myself, because I just wanted to, get the pictures. I'm about the only person who's taken the picture where you can actually see a president signing a bill because the press is in front of him. They can see him, but they can't see what he's writing. I'm always guy standing behind trying to get the picture. Uh -huh. I didn't care whether I was in the picture, but I wanted to get, and those are various presidential libraries. But I, I was born basically blind in one eye. 
which made it difficult to do like sports where you have to have depth perception and things of that nature. But my mother loved to photograph. I just caught the, the bug and my parents had a printing business. I'd look at how the pictures were arranged and set up and things we were printing. And I, I just enjoyed it. And I've uh, done that. I've got all the cameras I've had, including one when I think I was about eight years old. They gave me for my birthday with Hoplon and Cassidy. I've had a lot of people try to buy that camera since then, but it's, it's not for sale. But I love the photography and both Marcel and I will go back and say, oh, I remember when we were there. I remember, I remember that refugee camp. I kept one over my desk. I took it black and white uh, during um, conflicts in Central America. And these people just caught up in the, in the war between two factions there in a refugee camp. I remember one man was looking straight at me. I'd asked if I could take his picture. He had white hair, some of white beard. He was looking straight at me with the integrity in his eyes. I took the picture and I printed it up after and I looked at that. I, I couldn't take my eyes away. So I it's hanging over my desk, even today. And uh, I say, here's this man telling me, uh, I can never do anything for you. I can never help you. But what do you do for somebody like me? And I call that my conscience picture. And so I've, I've enjoyed, uh, I've enjoyed the photography. I now the person who has had some mixed emotions about it is the wonderful woman who's my archivist and try to put all my papers together. Uh, those will go to the UVM or elsewhere. And uh, she asked me how if I knew how many uh, photographs I've taken over these forty eight years. I said it's uh, well, it's probably the thousands. She said, the hundreds of thousands, would that be a little bit closer? And I said, whoops, <laughs> they're not all that great. So Senator, I have, I have one more question before we open it up for just two or three questions. But this question has to do with the polarization that we're in right now. How do we secure our democracy, work to stabilize our political climate? There are a lot of young people in the room tonight that, that want to play a role how do we how do we all play a role in this to strengthen our democracy? Get involved. Uh, get involved in, in campaigns, whether at the local level, state level, uh, national level. Uh, don't uh, don't feel you have to wait until somebody fits every single idea you want. That'll never happen. But find somebody, people, uh, men and women who are running for office. Uh, who have real integrity, who are willing to answer your questions, who aren't just trying to use talking points and help them, help them get elected. Uh, Brian, you know yourself in, in your campaigns, the people you attract, uh, they may go across the political spectrum, but they, they trust you. And uh, it's like the others you've mentioned here. Get involved with that, see what it is. Get a uh, internship. Uh, I've had people who've had internships in my office, and I, uh, I could give so many examples that they've become mayors and uh, uh, leading members of Congress, all of these, uh, and they they got the bug there. It's uh, it's important. I, uh, one last example was not even in politics. She, uh, you know, in turn, to talk to Marcel about what it was like she was in college, but uh, she wanted to be a nurse, a medical surgical nurse. Talked to Marcel about it, and they spent some time talking about why it'd be a good thing. But she also wanted to go into government. Flash forward a couple of decades, and this young military officer 
comes in my office. She's commanding the, uh, as a head nurse at one of our places in Europe where uh, American war wounded were coming back. She commanded the hospital flights that brought them to the, uh, to the US, to Walter Reed and hospital and all. But, but she was the one that they relied on to get them safely here. And I thought, you know, it's, it's nice to see that. It's, especially as the husband of a nurse who keeps me out of trouble most of the time. So the Senator was kind enough to say, you know, there are a couple other questions that people may have. Uh, yes, Zeta, I'll pass it right to you. Hi, what advice would you give for a prospective law student of what sort of things? Could you hold the microphone closer? I couldn't hear that. Um, what advice would you give for a prospective law student studying at Bennington? Like what sort of courses do you think would be helpful and what sort of work experiences do you think would be helpful? That's a good question because uh, you can do so many different things as a lawyer. Now you're going to get a basic sense of the law when in your first year there, certainly learn the, the Constitution, know uh, what it means. And then what do you want to do? Do you want to go to corporate law? Do you want to go to, into political law? Uh, I always enjoyed my time as a prosecutor, uh, the youngest uh, state's attorney in the state back when Chittenden County is a one one person states the jury said, that's great. I'd love to try cases. If you're interested in trial law, which is a specialized area, focus on that. But uh, make sure you get a solid basis in constitutional law. And then if you have specifics, you want business or something, go into that, but get a general feeling of the law in your first year. And that I think will shape more where you want to go after that. Okay. Hi. Um, we had uh, Congressman Peter Smith give us a talk uh, last week, and he uh, had a lot of praise for you. He said that when he ran, uh, he had to run as a Republican. Because I couldn't hear the... I'm sorry. Uh, no. So I'll start uh, and then pass it. But we had Congressman Smith, Peter Smith with us last week to talk about his time in Congress. And uh, he had an incredible amount of praise for you while he was speaking. Yes. Um, he said that when he was running, he effectively had to run as a Republican because at the time there was no Democratic Party in Vermont. And that you were kind of involved in, at the time, like building the Democratic Party in the state. And you kind of witnessed the shift of the state from a very red state to uh, more blue. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could like speak to that a little bit of what was that process like of kind of building a political party in a state where it was once non-existent? Well, Peter, Peter is a dear friend of mine. In fact, he was one of the first volunteers of my campaign when I, when I ran the first time and we've been friends and I've campaigned with him and he, I believe he's going to be elected to the Senate in a couple, uh, couple weeks. But, um, you know, I was reminded I'm in a state when I first ran that nobody under the age of 50 had been elected. Uh, I was 33 when I announced. We were the only state in the union that had never elected a Democrat, the only state. And uh, I ran, everybody said, okay, kids, you can have it, the nomination, because you can't win anyway. And uh, I saved two headlines from that election. One, one of our largest newspapers across the front page, big type, it says, poll dooms Leahy. Next one is five days later. Leahy unexpectedly wins. Well, you work for it. You work for it. 
uh, and you go out and you tell people what you stand for. You let, but then make sure you let them tell you what they stand for. I think people want to have their views known, whether you agree or disagree with each other, let them have that chance. Fortunately, we're a small state and you can do that. Don't worry about the party label, be yourself. Get, get your voice across, be honest, give the answers, and know that nobody owns a seat in the legislature or governor or anything else. You have to earn it and just go and, and fight for it. But be honest, be willing to answer any questions, even questions that you know are not going to be popular. That place, you'd be amazed how people respect honesty. Senator Leahy, we cannot thank you enough for joining us this evening. Uh, this has been incredibly informative and generous with your time. We also can't thank you enough for everything you've done for Vermont, for Bennington County, for the town of Bennington. So on behalf of everyone here, please accept our heartfelt congratulations on an incredible career. And we look forward to continuing the praise and celebration in the months to come. Thank you. Well, I, thank you. And I appreciate your high honor you've given me. Thank you.